Undoubtedly, with the experience you've had at Hopkins uh, and at Mayo Clinic, there have been unusual presentations of familial uh, amyloid. Um, could you share with us perhaps some of the ones that strike you that uh, are not of the usual paradigm of sensory motor and autonomic dysfunction? Yeah, well, I think when you see somebody who pr presents with all three of those, that's fairly typical, but you can see people who will present as a motor neuron disease, and they look like they may have ALS, and they turn out to have amyloidosis. Similarly, you can see people who present with pure autonomic neuropathy, and they turn out to have amyloidosis. Um, and so I think it's those sort of presentations that um, are often confusing. Um, one of the big things that has become very apparent across the world is that a lot of amyloidosis is misdiagnosed as CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, which is a demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy, meaning that there's weakness in proximal and distal muscles. Severe amyloidosis absolutely can present in that phenotype, but very rarely does it really have demyelinating features on electrophysiological testing. Um, People often ask why is it so often confused to be CIDP? And I think it's more the fact that neurologists around the world want to find a treatable cause of neuropathy and so that they misdiagnose CIDP in most neuropathies. And so many neuropathies are called CIDP when they really aren't CIDP. Some cases of TTR amyloidosis absolutely look like CIDP, but I think most don't. Um, the polyneuropathy with familial uh, transthyretin amyloidosis is a length-dependent process. Are there mutations that present with primarily upper extremity manifestations, or is that inconsistent with the disease? No, it can be fully consistent with the disease. And uh, the, the biggest example would be carpal tunnel syndrome patients could develop early and pronounced carpal tunnel and can be mistaken either for carpal tunnel syndrome itself or motor neuron disease. So it certainly can present uh, in the upper extremity predominant uh, form. And I also echo what Jim touched upon is I've had several cases that for all the world uh, looked exactly like CIDP, you know, electrophysiologically, uh, clinically, but only uh, the lack of response to treatment or family history prompted us to think about uh, HATTR. So uh, certainly it can present as a classic demyelinating neuropathy. Um. Not to be too provocative, but is there a reason then that uh, perhaps when CIDP is being considered as the diagnosis, there ought to be genetic testing to be sure that um, a case of ATTR is not being missed? So I think in most CIDP, no. So, so again, there we're maybe a little off topic here, but in general, CIDP presents as a motor predominant polyradicular neuropathy. And I think the testing you want to do is monoclonal proteins because they can be associated with that. And the big one is, is POM syndrome, which usually present with a lambda monoclonal protein. You want to do an HIV test. One could say you could do a genetic test. I don't think that would be the wrong answer, but it's certainly not my practice. You put a person on treatment and very quickly they respond. And the treatment usually is intravenous immunoglobulin or prednisone or plasma exchange. I think when they don't respond to that conventional therapy, within a couple months, three, four months, then one certainly should think more broadly, do genetic testing, and potentially nerve biopsy is a good thing to do in that. Because it's not just amyloid you're thinking about at that point either. There are other things as well. Um, I would like to add that there are other um, organ manifestations of TTR, and it's important to keep them in mind. Uh, we have a series of uh, urogenital uh, amyloid at Boston University um, spanning uh, three decades. And in that population uh, is a subgroup that is TTR, so that people may present with hematuria um, and on biopsy of the bladder demonstrated amyloid. 
it's really critical that the audience understands that it's not sufficient simply to diagnose amyloid. You have to know what the amyloidogenic protein is because that's what defines the clinical course uh, and as well uh, the therapeutic options. So that really is quite important.